explain a little of why I chose a weird Bible passage is that, well, technically I wasn't actually supposed to be preaching tonight. Uh, we had had some other ideas first, but then it um, sort of fell through, and uh, the buck stops with me when things fall through, so I was up. And my original idea was that I would just preach you uh, this morning's sermon, which is particularly good, by the way, and if you haven't listened to this morning's sermon, go and have a listen to it. Uh, you will enjoy that. But I was hesitant to do it tonight because it was part three of a series. And I'm going, you can't start at part three of a series. It just won't make any sense. And if I started at part one, I wouldn't be able to do part two and three because Mulk is coming next week. Um, it would be, be fantastic. Uh, next Sunday night, uh, Mulk from Pulse will be here sharing with us. But something triggered within me when I was listening to Mad Matt last week. Wasn't he great? Um, he's sharing. And there was something about something he said that I just wanted to pick, on, pick up on. He, he sort of said he found uh, a passion and a purpose in Jesus. He shared that on that journey of faith that he went through from teenage ship into adult ship, there was something that grew, uh, this passion, this purpose, this understanding, to the point where his relationship with Jesus changed, that he knew that he couldn't walk away anymore, that it was, you know, he'd passed that point of no return. He could not walk away from Jesus. And it's that sense of passing that point of no return that I just wanted to pick up on tonight. And I kept on thinking, I've done a sermon on this, I've done a sermon on this. And I looked up what I thought the sermon was and I read it and I went, no, that's no good for night church. <laughs> so I went, oh no, what am I going to do? God is stirring something within me, what is it going to do? It just so happened that as I was searching, I stumbled across another sermon entitled Beyond Belief. And when I read that, I went, oh, there's some stuff in there that would really speak to night church. This would be great. The only problem was, this is Sermon 5 out of a 12-series sermon. Yes, I have done at one point in time a 12-week series. Um, would you like me to do it here one time? <laughs> it's on 1 John. It was amazing, but it went for three months. <laughs> um, anyway, so I, I thought, Shall I do this? And God kept on prompting me, going, yes, this is the right sermon. You've actually heard one of these sermons before out of the series, because when I did my Greek sermon the other, about a month ago, remember that one where I taught you how to use the Greek tools? That was number four out of the series. So you've heard a little bit of this series already. Um, I just uh, thought, well, all right, if God's prompting me, let's go. So are you ready for this? I also have to apologise. Did you see what, when you're working through a passage verse by verse, it just so happens that this verse speaks about the Antichrist. <laughs> so I'm going, oh my goodness, I just have to start by talking about the Antichrist. Do you want me to try and explain the Antichrist or just skip over that part? Yeah, yeah, explain it. That's what I thought you were going to say. So I have got some stuff down here. All right, let's, let's look at this first part. Uh, verse 18. Now, I'm going to see if I can get some stuff up on the screen now. Uh, Dear children, it is the last hour, and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. Well, that's pretty self-explanatory. I don't need to explain that one, do I? <laughs> even in the first verse, verse in they're going, what is he talking about here? What is he talking about? This is the problem with working through a book of the Bible preaching verse by verse, is that you have to talk about the confusing verses as well as the good verses. Have you ever heard these terms before? The Antichrist, the last hour? <laughs> you know, have you heard these things? How do we even understand them? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but I have to talk about them because it was part of our Bible reading. Well, one thing that I've learned, uh, as I have already preached on 1 John is that if we want to understand a phrase that jumps out, you look at where that phrase is used elsewhere in the Bible and sort of go, well, how does the other parts of the Bible talk about things like the Antichrist and the, the last hour? So that makes sense, doesn't it? So do you know where else in the Bible the word Antichrist or the phrase the last hour is used? Nowhere. <laughs> no, this is it. This is it. 
Uh, the word Antichrist is only used four times in the whole Bible, twice in the reading we had today, one in two chapters later in 1 John chapter 4 and one in the book of 2 John. John is the only person in the whole Bible who uses this term, the Antichrist. And those references give little, very little context. And the phrase, the last hour, is only used here, nowhere else in the Bible. There's other phrases in the Bible like, um, you know, when they're talking about the last days or the judgment day, but this is the only place that it uses that phrase, the last hour. And it's hard to try and get a context to this because a letter is only one half of the conversation. We're talking to a group of people who, um, you know, we're reading Paul's side of a conversation with a group of people and we're not quite sure what he's talking about when he's writing to these people. Did they ask a question about Antichrist? Have, is there something that's happening at the time that he's referring to? Well, some people have done a little bit of work on this one and there was a bit of a disagreement at the time in the churches that John were writing to. And the, basically the idea is they were wrestling with who is Jesus? You know, this Jesus, they all knew of Jesus, but who was Jesus really? What's, what's the heart of who Jesus is? And what does Jesus actually do for us now? Because Jesus had died and rose again and gone off to heaven. So what's the point of Jesus now? What are the promises that Jesus is giving us that are relevant to us now? And the third one that was really interesting that I wrestled with at the time is how do we relate to this Jesus? Because half the people that were still alive knew Jesus and talked to Jesus. And now these people are going, well, I wasn't alive then, so how do I relate to Jesus? What, what, what's Jesus to me other than a story? How does this work? And so some of this stuff that John is writing to them is... is and trying to wrestle with these ideas of, um, yeah, who is Jesus? So rather than talk about the last hour, because if John was writing about the last hour in 1950 years ago and it still hasn't happened yet, I'm not quite sure what John was talking about there. So shall I look at these things instead? And it actually leads into the stuff that I think that Matt was talking about last week and I'll make a connection there. And I possibly will come back to Antichrist at the end. Let's see how we go. So, who is Jesus really? I'm only going to use the Bible reading to answer these questions, if that makes sense. Because but there's lots of other stuff in the Bible about who is Jesus. But in John, in these Bible readings, he says, Who is the liar? Anyone who denies that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. Or in some translations, they write there, Jesus is the Messiah. The Messiah literally means the one who has come to save, or the one who saves, or saviour, which is why we, um, in a song later on, we're going to actually sing um, Jesus' saviour. You can move a mountain? Okay. Yes, I was going to say, you. <laughs> have I mucked that one up? Yes. Um, so yeah, Jesus is the one who saves. Jesus is the one who saves. And so what John is trying to say in these readings is that who is Jesus really? Well, we are told that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who saves. And anyone who denies that, John is being a bit rough and saying, well, you're the liar. I'm not lying about this. This is who Jesus is. He goes on to actually say um, that anyone who, you know, this is the foundation belief of Christianity. And anyone who doesn't believe that Jesus is the Christ or the Saviour um, denies the Son and the Father. Uh, the Son has the Father and whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father. So he's saying, you know, this is a non-negotiable in all of this, that Jesus is the one who saves. If we can't believe that, then what's the whole point of following this one? We follow Jesus because Jesus is the Christ. So that was John's first point. But what does Jesus actually do now? All okay, right, he was the saviour, but what about now? What does that mean for us in, well, them in, in um, you know, 30 years after Jesus lived, but for us 2,000 years after Jesus lived? Well, in verse 25, he gives the answer to that one too. It says, and this is what he has promised, eternal life. Or if you know the Greek for eternal life, because I said it a month ago, do you remember what it is? It's zoe, aeon zoe. Zoe is life, but it's the sort of life not that we are alive and breathing. Zoe is the deep, rich, meaningful, abundant life that Jesus says he's come to bring. And 
aeon is eternal. So John is saying, this is the difference it makes because in Jesus we find life. This rich, deep, full, abundant life. That is the difference that Jesus can bring. That Jesus has come to offer us that life right here, right now. Then we get to the last part. So how do we actually relate to Jesus and this is the stuff that I thought was really interesting when I was rereading the sermon and I thought this is what's going to be helpful for us tonight so you're listening to this part because this is the part that I think that I was told to preach on for this reason (laughs) one of the things that John does in this passage is a really interesting twist on words Um, he uses a particular word in this part of the passage four times. Can you see the word in here? Four times it jumps out of this passage. Truth is in there twice, oh, three times. Oh, it nearly was truth. I want to say no. I said four times. Where's the fourth one? Three times. <laughs> Oops. He uses it once beforehand too. This word no, that we are to know the truth know the truth and because we know it no like in comfort it, this idea of knowing john really likes the word no he uses it 150 times in his writing and john only writes four books of the bible john and the three letters he uses it 150 times he likes the word no there's another word that john almost uses the equivalent amount it's the word believes so like john three sixteen, anyone who believes in jesus will have aeon zoe eternal life so he uses these two words what is interesting is where he uses it john in his writing because he wrote the gospel first and then he writes a little as later in the gospels he uses this word believe a lot it dominates if you read the gospel of john there's all these words believe John's saying, I write these things so you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. It's all through the Gospel of John. But when he gets to the letters of John, which is about 30 years later, he's changed that to know. I want you to know the Christ. (laughs) It's just an interesting switch of words. Is it just because John's getting a bit old and senile and is just using a different word? Or is there something in this play of words that John talked a lot about believing And now he's talking a lot about knowing. Part of that comes from the people that he is writing to. When John wrote the gospel, he was writing to a largely uh, wide community who did not know Jesus. He literally writes that at the last verse in his his gospel. I write these things so that you may believe in Jesus. (laughs) So they don't know who Jesus is. He's written his gospel so they may understand who Jesus is and believe in Jesus. The letters are not written to a largely non-church group of people. They are written to the church. And not only a new church, but a church that's been around for a while. And so maybe the difference is in the context. At the beginning he's saying, I want you to understand who Jesus is and believe in Jesus. But once you've been with Jesus for a while, there's a progression here. I don't want you just to believe in Jesus. I want you to know Jesus oh I thought there was another page after that I want you to know Jesus can you see that I was sort of an idea and I think that's what Matt was saying that's what I was hearing Matt saying last week that there was a progression in his life as well that he said I got saved in this church but he also said that he started on this journey and that relationship with Jesus changed Changed from just having that understanding, well, I believe that Jesus is the Saviour and I believe that he died on the cross for me, to suddenly being, no, there's something deeper and richer in here that I've discovered so much so that I can never walk away from Jesus. I guess my challenge for tonight is to say that I think there is a difference between believing and knowing. When I originally wrote this sermon, I was listening to a bloke called Shane Hibbs who um, used to preach, I think he still is at the church that Rob Bell um, was at, and so they used to preach together, and Shane is actually Australian, and I was listening to some of his sermons, um, and he was talking about a time that he went to sailing camp, 
and was a bit annoyed that the first two days of sailing camp was spent in the classroom learning about how to sail a boat. And he's going, I've come to sail, not to sit in a classroom and learn about it. This is silly. But on the third day, they got out on the boat. And he said the problem was there was this bit of a, a gap between having the knowledge of how to sail and being actually able to sail. He said... To think that just because he sat in a classroom for two days, he would then jump on a boat and be able to fly all around the lake. He says he, he knew what to do, but he couldn't make that happen initially. And it was actually a bit of a journey as he got to know the boat and got to know, yes, you don't pull that rope too tight, otherwise you capsize, but rather you've got to feel how strong the wind is. I don't know, I'm not a sailor. Um, I'm just relaying his story. And he said after a while... He, it wasn't just he you know, believed the stuff that the teachers had told him. He actually began to see that this is the truth. And he knew how to sail a boat. Can you see the slight difference? And Chain was saying, I think that this is similar to what this reading is saying in John. That, yeah, we get taught a whole lot of stuff in church. And we believe in Jesus. But then how do we actually take that step of being able to be open to you? journeying with Jesus and getting to know Jesus. All right, I said I was going to tell you a tiny bit more about the Antichrist at the end. I actually think this all ties together, believe it or not. I'm drawing a very low bow here and see if I can get away with this. What is an Antichrist? Well, if Christ is the saviour, the one who comes to bring us life, then could we argue that the Antichrist is someone who doesn't believe in that abundant life, who doesn't step in and embraces that abundant life? Maybe an Antichrist is someone who chooses to believe the bad news over the good news, so to speak. If, if Jesus has come to bring us good news, and an Antichrist is someone who says, I don't want the good news, I'm going to stick with this instead. So an Antichrist may be not be this some evil person who's running around creating chaos, but someone who just says, you know, if Christ has come to bring us life, I choose this instead. But if you flip that around, that means a believer is somebody who does embrace the good news that Jesus brings. That does say, I believe that Jesus has come to bring us life and life in all its fullness. Even when we're surrounded by the bad news, we still believe that. And maybe a believer is somebody who steps into that process of not only believing the good news, but actually knowing the reality of that in their life. If you want to know Jesus more, I'm very happy to have conversations on how you can know Jesus more.